Good morning, Woodstock Church family. Typically, I would say it's good to see you, but uh, I'm not I'm not seeing you all. You are seeing me, but it's good to be able to communicate uh, at least uh, through this venue. We're grateful for the opportunities and uh, blessings that God gives us to be together and to worship Him, and we pray that we'll do that today in spirit and truth as well. Uh, we truly miss being together physically as a family, but in a spiritual sense, we are together, and hopefully from uh, this situation, we will be stronger together uh, as time goes on. Now, the first century church was scattered abroad when they began. Uh, there was a problem with persecution, and they scattered abroad, but they came together, uh, spiritually speaking, and we have an enemy that we are dealing with today. It's an invisible one. Uh, one, no doubt, that uh, Satan enjoys implementing, but one that we can, we can defeat, and with the help of God, blessings will come from it. Um, as our nation experiences this occurrence, this threatening vir uh, virus, there is a phrase that, that is being used uh, quite extensively, and that is social distancing. Uh, it seems to be seems to be the new normal now that we are to stay away from uh, groups of people in order not to spread the virus. But we have to make sure that our social distancing doesn't lead us to a spiritual distancing. And so that's uh, one of many reasons that we are getting together through this venue. Uh, this lesson is being provided in order to encourage home worship in order to worship God in spirit and truth, especially on the first day of the week. But we don't want to think that we need to limit ourselves to the first day of the week when we worship God in our homes. Uh, we are committed to honor God and to do uh, as he wants to please him, and he wants us to engage in each act of worship, especially on the first day of the week through singing and praying, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, giving of our means, and now through this venue of teaching. Viruses, or not meeting together anytime, do not diminish God's desire for us to worship Him. It's just as strong as His desire for us to worship Him should be our desire to offer worship to Him. And anytime we are away from our Woodstock family, if we're out of town, we should seek to do this with, with other faithful congregations. But even if we don't have the uh, access to another congregation, home worship is, is vital, it's necessary, and should be accessed in order to worship God. Our hearts are saddened this week from the passing of our beloved sister, Peggy Winters, and she has gone on to her reward, and we want to keep her family in mind, and we want to think of the good memories that we have of, of Peggy and how she blessed our lives, her desire to worship God. Many times uh, I had the opportunity to speak with her as she had to be absent from the services, and she had a deep desire to be there, and uh, we're, we're grateful for her life, and we look forward to seeing her again. I want to ask a question as we begin. How, how volatile have you seen your life in the last couple of weeks? As we see schools closing, we see employees being encouraged to work from home. We see the cancellation of entertainment situations, the cancellation of sporting events, even the cancellation of worship services. How have you viewed all of that? What's at the heart of these unprecedented measures? What's behind it all? What is it that we are afraid of that might happen? Are the leaders of the world humbled at the fact that they can do relatively little to uh, control this uh, present reality? That no army can stop it? No nuclear arsenal can deter it? that there is no drug that can contain it? Are we humbled by the reality that we are nowhere near as independent 
and confident of the control that we have of our lives. I know I've thought about these many times in the last few weeks. Just three weeks ago, it seemed like we had more control of our lives. We had vacations planned and weddings planned and, and different things that we never thought that we wouldn't do. But here it is. I guess we could say that we have a different kind of March Madness. Uh, many of us that are sports enthusiasts were looking forward to the college basketball playoff, March Madness. But we have another March Madness now, something that we didn't plan for. But all of our plans were either put on hold or they blew up in, like a puff of smoke. A lot like James says, like a vapor that appears for a little while and then just kind of vanished away. One of the things that I remember as I was growing up as a child was how a lot of the older folks at the end of their conversation, they, they would end those conversations with the words, Lord willing, or if the Lord wills. And when I was smaller, I really didn't appreciate the significance of that, but I really do now. And it makes me yearn for uh, those times again where people were so dependent upon God that they would be willing to say that they would be doing this or that and end that idea with the phrase, if the Lord wills. You know, James talks about that in, in his book, chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, when he says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you don't even know what is on the morrow, what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life, James asks. And that's the question that we're asking today. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Even in the context of our lives, even if those lives be 80 or 90, 100 years, the point is that it's a very small time, and it's a time that we don't really control. It's interesting. He goes on to say, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And in a very real way, when we make plans and we just assure ourselves that's what we're going to do, God calls that boasting. Boasting about the control that we're over. Boasting that we're able to manipulate our lives in such a way that we are just confident of what we are going to do. How we're going to plan those things. Things that we thought last week that nothing would stop us from doing have almost instantaneously been stopped. Well, who or what is in control? How do you suppose God is viewing this situation? He, he refers to himself, Jesus does, as the good shepherd. Uh, does he look down at us and seeing us like sheep without a shepherd? This situation in the world has blossomed into what we now call a pandemic. A pandemic, a disease that's prevalent over a nation or even over the whole world like this coronavirus, pandemic. And this is not the first pandemic that's ever hit our world. Another word for a pandemic may be a plague. We read about many plagues in the Bible, don't we? Pharaoh and Egypt and Israel, back at the time of Moses, saw ten plagues or pandemics over the whole nation of, of Egypt and the world at that time. Well, this pandemic did not take God by surprise. God didn't say, well, you know, I need to change my plans now because uh, of this coronavirus. That's not how it happened in God's mind. Sin is like this coronavirus. You know, it, it, it seems as if we think that we are in more control of our lives if we don't have a physically life-threatening virus 
or something akin to that that is prevalent at a particular time. We were just as dependent and just as much, from a significant standpoint, out of control before this ever came to be. James says, what is your life? You don't know from day to day what's going to happen. You know, we know that the disease and, and death and different maladies take place to disrupt our plans all the time. This is just a concentrated one on a worldwide basis that seemingly gets our attention. But does God have our attention even during other times? You know, are, are we just excited about the sin pandemic as we are about a viral pandemic? In fact, which one is even worse? As God's people, we need to have a calculated calm as we approach any pandemic, but we need to see as serious, even more serious, the pandemic of sin. Because of media information and sometimes disinformation, people are terrified. People are worried. But you know, when you peel back that anxiety, what is it at the heart of all of this? What is it? that we are worried about. Really, do we trust Jesus as the good shepherd that even if we go in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil? We ought to consider what he says because he beat death. You remember, he, he was crucified, he was resurrected, and after that resurrection, 500 people saw him at one time. He won the victory over death. He won the victory over sin, that great spiritual pandemic. And so it's to Jesus that we should go to answers in our dependent states, and we ought to consider what he says. He knew what it was like to be anxious about death. Do you remember in the garden before he died? The Bible tells us that he sweat great drops of blood. You know, I know that we're very concerned about this pandemic, but I don't know anybody yet who has been sweating drops of blood where the blood corpuscles actually break and come through the skin. Yes, there is an anxiousness that goes along with our current state, but nothing like that as it deals with sin. Jesus knew what, it would, what it's like to worry about death. In fact, in uh, John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, Jesus is with his apostles. And Jesus was about ready to die, and his apostles were worried about him and what their lives were going to be. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. That's a command. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare that place for you, and if I go and prepare that place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So in this context of intense worry, Jesus is saying, keep your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on the home that he is going to prepare. And as you do, let not your heart be troubled. Well, the Old Testament classic passage that we're all familiar with gives this same instruction. The Lord, or literally there, since the Lord is my shepherd, I will not be in want. I won't be lacking. I won't be lacking for uh, control because I realize that he's the one in control. I won't be lacking because he's going to cause me to lie down in green pastures. You know, when we think of the color green, we think of something that is that is smoothing, that is easing. The color green, unlike the color red, which would indicate to us uh, something contrary to something that is a calming effect, green does that. God says, I'm going to make you to lie down in green pastures, even though you go through the valley of the shadow of death. 
In other words, the Lord is saying, if you are not so proud and boastful about being in control and you will humble yourself to allow me to be in control, I'm going to make you lie down in green pastures no matter where you are, no matter what pandemic it is. No matter if it's the sin that we see all around us, no matter if it's a virus, no matter what it is. Today, more and more people are troubled because they feel out of control. And no matter what the situation is, that is why we are anxious. That's why we are worried. Why are marriages suffering today? Because there is a feeling of being out of control. Why are there problems at work? from employees because they feel like they're losing control. Why are their home situations? What is the result of this pandemic virus? People are feeling like they're out of control. But to the faithful Christian, he or she doesn't have to worry because they've given up that control. They have given it to God. And we take all kinds of precautions, don't we? And we should in order to stem the tide of this pandemic. Well, same way spiritually. We take precautions that we have done that which puts us in the care of God. And in a very real sense, we are controlling ourselves. We are at more liberty because we've given that control to God. And so that is where our confidence comes. That's where this peace like a river comes, no matter what our situation is in life. Well, what makes us think? that we have control when the virus is not around. Is it our relatively good health? Is it our wealth? Is it the fact that we're healthy, wealthy? How about wise? Does this give us a feeling of control? Well, you know, that's Satan's lie. We are in no more control of our lives even when those situations are present. God knew as we've said earlier, God knew about this virus 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. This did not take God by surprise. He isn't changing his plans in 2020 because this virus popped up. Well, then the question remains, as we are in the valley of this virus, how should the Christian respond? And the Bible is replete with ways that Christians are to respond during times of trouble or crisis as the world basically sees those times. Look at Matthew chapter 6, another very familiar verse, beginning in verse 25. On, as Jesus is, is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he says these words, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Wow, that's heavy. How are we not to worry about our life? And Jesus is not saying don't consider things, don't plan for the future, don't, don't think at all about your life. But he's saying in the general perspective, your physical life does not compare to your spiritual life. Do not worry about your life only. Don't be taken away with it that you really don't consider the spiritual aspect of life. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? Is not spiritual life the most important thing here? More than food, the body, more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they. Which one of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? We might say, how many of you can worry about adding one inch to your height? So why do you worry about these things? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor do they spin. They don't spin to make their clothes. They don't work for a living. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these lilies. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, you know, flowers don't last long, grass doesn't last long, we cut it, 
it dies, and it's gone. He's saying that's what our physical lives are like. And he's going to take care of the necessities of life. Why are we worried about that? And that's the question we're asking during this pandemic. Where is our main worry? Where is our main concern? How much more will God clothe you, give you what you need? O oh, you of little faith. So, therefore, verse 31, do not worry, saying, well, what are we going to eat tomorrow? Oh, what about those lines at the grocery store? How long are we going to have to stay in those long lines? Oh, and all the fights that are happening in the grocery store over toilet paper. Really. There are so many other things in our short life that we really are not in control of to the specific degree, that we need to worry about other than these things. I know that faithful members of the church especially don't have to worry about these things because we have each other. David said that he never knew anybody of God's seed begging bread. And you know what? I don't see it in the world either. Yes, there are, there are hunger issues in many parts of the world. But you know, I have never seen or have never heard where faithful members of the church are begging bread. Why do we worry about such things? Jesus said, for after all, these are the things that the world, the Gentiles, worry about or seek after. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. You show your dependence upon him, and he will see to your every need. And here it is. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these mundane things will be added unto you. Paul would later say in Philippians chapter 4, he tells us many times how to think, how to think during these times. And in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Just when we're healthy, wealthy, and wise? Just when the birds are singing and the sun is shining? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoicing is something that is more internal than happiness. Many times external variables make us happy. But joy comes from the confidence that we have deep down inside. And he says in these times, rejoice always. That's how I can rejoice in the times of famine and pestilence and viruses. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. As we are in the valley of the virus right now. Paul, by inspiration, is saying, you let your gentleness, you let your calmness be known to all men. Don't join in their worry. Don't join in the fact that they're talking about not knowing how to get through and, and worrying about the future. As a child of God, you are not glorifying your God by chiming in with their uncertainty. They need to see your cool, calculated calmness as you worry about the things you need to worry about, like the sin pandemic, more so than this viral pandemic. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is near. And be anxious for nothing. Jesus says, don't consider your life Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But Paul, don't you know about this pandemic virus idea? Don't you know how everybody's just up in arms and how they're, what they're going to do to extend physical life? Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Not that he doesn't know what you need before you even ask. But he's wanting, to sh wanting us to show our dependence upon him. Acknowledging that he is in control, thereby not boasting in our, in our own self-sufficiency. And if we do this, verse 7 says, Then the peace of God, which surpasses all of this worldly understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. He cares for his sheep. He is in control. Roll with it. That's basically 
what we do in the valley of the virus. He's causing us to lie down in green pastures if we will give him this control. But when a virus, com when, when a virus comes, do we forget these things? When death comes, do we forget these things? When illness comes, do we forget these things? Well, what a great example. The Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, what they both went through. I think they're authorities on the subject. And we need to play, uh, pay close attention. The Lord strengthens our faith. We want to grab hold of something. Can you remember those back in the days of the flood? And they were in the water. They were desperately trying to grab hold of something. We've seen the movie Titanic. And when the Titanic went down and people were in the cold Atlantic, they were looking for pieces of wood or suitcase or something to grab hold of. They were frantic with saving their lives. We have something to grab hold of today. If we will humble ourselves and grab hold of that, he will cause us, even in the midst of the flood, of the storm, of the virus, he will cause us to lie down in green pastures. Grab on to Jesus and don't worry primarily about the sickness. Because you know what? No matter what the situation is, in this life, it's the nature of this life, there will always be unfulfilled promises. There will be broken dreams. There will be uh, health that is lost. And there will always be these things in life. We are going to need someone who does not change, who is steadfast and sure, who provides that anchor for our existence. The valleys are there for a reason. Not that God causes them all, but those valleys are there to give God the glory. They're used by God, not necessarily created by God, but the question is, how do we respond? Well, the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know what I've learned about this virus? It's giving us more time to talk to people about the Lord. We're not going to work now. So how do we give God the glory through this virus? How did Jesus give glory to God dying on the cross? The worst thing that ever happened became the best example of evangelism that we've ever had. How did Paul glorify God by having that thorn in the flesh that he fervently prayed for God to remove? And all of the beatings and shipwrecks that he went through, he glorified God the most in those times. Jesus glorified the Father the most in those times. We will glorify our God the most during the pandemic virus if we realize what our life is truly about. The sin pandemic is much worse. Let's go save people from that flood, from that disease that will cause their souls to be eternally lost. That's our response during the time of crisis. And particularly this one, the first century church, as we said in our introduction, was scattered abroad. And guess what? Because of persecution, because of the enemy. And when they were scattered abroad, the church grew like it never grew before. Do we want to grow the church at Woodstock? Do we want the worldwide church to grow? God has allowed us an opportunity to do that. And that's how we respond. But it's interesting when we respond that way, then our thoughts are out of this idea of what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How are we going to take care of our physical needs? God says, put the kingdom first. Don't worry about that. That's his area. He'll take care of that. And secondly, during this time that we are in the valley of the virus, we need to realize that how we respond and how people see us in this valley is so important. This will determine, in many situations, how they will respond to God when they see God's people in the valley, in the valley of the virus. Jesus saw the lepers, didn't he? And when Jesus saw the lepers, what did he do? He violated the isolation ban. And he went and touched them. The lepers. I'm not encouraging us all to violate the isolation ban. And to go get in groups and see how much we can spread the virus. But I'm saying spiritually, mentally, we need to rise above the pandemic 
We need to rise above just thinking that we want to stay away from people. And we want to rise above the isolation band. And we want to get the gospel message to people. And that's how God's people are to respond. We rise above it and we come out of the valley where God promises that he will bless. Jesus, we sing many times, is the lily of the valley. And he is, no matter what valley we might be experiencing. But as we are apart physically during this time of worldly secular crisis, there should be no crisis going on in our souls and our spirits, realizing that God is in control. We have the scripture, we have the examples of how we are to react in this valley. And I encourage you today, together, we can win against this virus, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But still, they are mighty in God to the pulling down of what appears to be these strongholds. And as we give glory to God, he promises the victory will be ours. I appreciate being together with you uh, today. I look forward to the time where we can be back together physically at the church building. Until that time, realize that God's family is there for you in uh, any need that you might have. We want to meet that need. Let's keep the lines of communication open. The plan is to have these lessons uh, available for your home worship, especially on Sunday. And again, we, we really encourage you and God expects you to worship him on the first day of the week. This valley doesn't take away that responsibility, but we see it more than a responsibility. We see it as a blessed privilege to thank God and to glorify God, even during these times. So God bless you, stay strong, and we will see you next time.